Karen Streeter and I'd like to welcome you to the Team A Small Scale Wind Capture Project Presentation. In this presentation, several members of Team A, or as we like to call ourselves, Team Awesome, will take you through the process we underwent to develop a concept for small scale urban wind power generation. Before we dive into the design, I'd like to share with you the problem statement for this project. The main section of the problem statement reads, your task is to conceptualize, design, and prototype a device that generates electricity from the wind and that can be mounted on a conventional building roof or siding in Atlanta, Georgia. In case your design is successful, our customer would like to utilize your device in other cities within the U.S. as well. In order to develop the most useful solution for our customer, we must first understand who our customer is. So before splitting into two separate design teams, the class as a whole decided to come up with our target user profile, as well as a list of general requirements to be used as a baseline for each team's subsequent design work. The class identified three possible customer profiles which are listed here. As a class, it was decided that our target customer would be the third option. After selecting an appropriate customer, the class as a whole defined several requirements that would help guide and somewhat constrain the final system. In order to create our own more comprehensive list of requirements, we conducted background research on a number of topics shown in this slide. From these topics, we were able to identify such things as what kind of wind profiles we're able to work with, what kind of materials we would need to be able to mount the system to, and what sort of tax credits we could be eligible for. After completing the background research, we were able to create a more comprehensive list of requirements. We broke all of these generated requirements into four sections. Functional requirements, physical requirements, performance, and safety and compliance. Keeping us constrained where needed while also allowing for design freedom. Now I'm going to hand you over to Samin, who will present you with our team operating parameters and schedule structure. Hi everyone, my name is Samin Adwani and I served as a project manager for our group. I wanted to go over First, the organization structure for our group. Our team consisted of seven on-campus students and eight distance learning students. The project managers decided to have three sub-teams for our group, the design team, the analysis team, and the writing team. Now, the project managers would each be a part of this, these teams, as well as oversee the project's progress. We came up with specific responsibilities for each sub-team as well as the project manager. The most important thing for the project manager was to initially come up with a requirements list so that the group would be able to develop a system that catered to these requirements. The design team consisted of seven members. The most important tasks for the design team were to analyze their final design as well as come up with the initial conceptual design. Now the final design analysis goes hand in hand with the analysis team. The analysis team consisted of five people and again the most important responsibilities for them were the final design analysis as well as the efficiency calculations. The project managers decided to have responsibilities that overlapped between the two teams to ensure that they would be working together. The writing team consisted of three members. The most important task for the writing team was to ensure that they were compiling all of the work that was being done by the rest of the group in order to ensure that we could track our progress. Next, I wanted to go over the proposed schedule that was developed for our team at the very beginning of the project. Each team was given a Gantt chart to help organize their team schedules, as well as an overall schedule that was made by the project managers to manage the entire group's progress. Thank you, Samin. This is Michael, and next I'll be providing a high-level look into the overall design process. After completing the planning and task clarification phase, the first step for the design team was to ensure alignment on the essential problem of transforming the kinetic energy of the wind into electrical energy. There was also a more detailed breakdown of the specific problems that have to be solved to accomplish this, which will be discussed in more detail in subsequent slides. Along with the problem statement, our design strategy was defined early. We focused from the onset on creating an open engineering system that utilizes product families, ranged values, modularization, standardization, and personalization. Through the design process, it was determined that the best path for efficiency and overall quality was to focus on the novel design for some components, the turbine blade for example, while working in parallel on finding acceptable off-the-shelf parts for items such as the generator. 
Finally, it was quickly determined that beginning in separate design and analysis teams was ineffective given the scope of the project and the time allowed, so we rapidly moved to an all-hands-on-deck approach, which proved to be very successful. Here is a diagram of a general wind turbine structure that was used as a starting point for our design. A traditional wind turbine consists of an impeller, gearbox, generator, mounting structure, and housing. The general design process used was a modified Paul and Bites approach, which you can see on this slide. The top section is the conceptual design, followed by the embodiment and detailed design phase. As shown in the legend in the top right, there were some activities that were performed by the group, the Green Ovals, some that were done by a single individual, the Red Diamonds, and finally, some that were done by multiple individuals in parallel, the Orange Squares. As you can see, we leveraged the overall knowledge and bandwidth of the group to accomplish all but three steps of the design process, which allowed us to work efficiently and effectively. Next, I'll provide some insight into the work that we, need, we did during the conceptual design phase, followed by a discussion on the detailed design of various structures. Here is an illustration of the various high-level function structures that were identified. As can be seen, they were divided into two categories, primary, those that would drive the design, and secondary, those that would fill in the gaps. Owners were identified for each function and the inputs, outputs, and physical interfaces were defined to facilitate clear communication within the team. In general, we utilized documents that resided in the cloud, such as this spreadsheet, to track work and hand off design information. This allowed us to successfully leverage the bandwidth of the entire group through concurrent engineering. Finally, here's a depiction of the method used to evaluate potential solutions. Separating the system into primary and secondary functions allowed us to more efficiently evaluate solutions and make design decisions as there are greater than 2,000 possible combinations. Each of the functions, shown previously, were broken down into sub-functions and working principles which were then combined into working structures. Solution variants were mapped out through a morphological matrix that was created containing all of the functions and structures. And then all of the variants were evaluated based on the chosen criteria. In the end, the intriguing solutions were pursued further. Next, I will dive into the embodiment and detailed design of our WIM Capture device, which will provide more insight into the design decisions that were made along the way and the strategy that was used for various functions. Embodiment design of turbine blades started with consideration of those requirements deemed to have an immediate impact upon the embodiment design process. These included the energy production requirement and the minimum operating wind speed. Design began with the development of a preliminary range of blade diameters which could provide acceptable power output based on the given requirements. The only optimized parameter during the design activity was the tip speed ratio, which describes the speed of the blade tips in relation to the wind free wind speed. This was optimized in order to maximize the power input, however selection of an optimized value did not hinder off-design performance due to the relatively small changes in the power coefficient over tip speed ratios of 4 to 10. After a range of blade rotor diameters were developed, further detail was added by developing the optimal combination of cord and lift coefficients along with the blade twist profile to optimize performance of the design tip speed ratio. Developing the optimal cord lift coefficient combination instead of developing the cord coefficient based upon the lift coefficient or vice versa allowed changes to be easily incorporated later in design. Embodiment design continued with consideration of airfoils, which would provide a low cut-in speed for operation in Atlanta, but would not limit performance in environments with naturally higher wind speeds. First, the team envisioned using different airfoils based upon rotor diameters, as larger diameters would experience faster tip speeds and thus higher Reynolds numbers. But later, focus shifted to selecting a robust airfoil design that provided acceptable performance over a range of Reynolds numbers. Embodiment design continued with determination of how the blades should be actively pitched to maintain optimal performance despite changes in wind speed. This design feature did not determine rotor sizing or blade profiling and as such was treated as an auxiliary function carrier. Analysis of the designs in regards to torque, RPM, and moments created were next produced and the range of designs were compared against the given technical and economic criteria. This development of range solutions eliminated the need for excessive iteration and helped the designers focus on design refinement instead. After minimal iteration, 
a range of final acceptable designs were detailed. Embodiment design culminated in three turbine diameters, ranging from 2 to 4 meters in diameter. These designs offered a range of possible power outputs based upon wind speed and allowed for different customer requirements to be satisfied without redesign. Developing the blade profiles consisted of selecting an optimal cord lift coefficient distribution across the length of the blade. This slide shows the blade profile for the 2 meter diameter turbine. As you can see, the blade has been broken up into 10 sections, each of which has an optimal cord lift coefficient measurement and an optimal twist angle. The twist angle is required because the relative wind speed along the blade length will differ due to the difference in rotational speed along the blade. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, the airfoil at the root of the blade has a lower tangential velocity in the plane of the blade motion than does the airfoil at the tip. This results in a different relative wind speed angle along the blade, requiring a, requiring a blade twist to take full advantage of this effect. Ultimately, the SG6043 airfoil was selected for use with all turbine diameters. As shown by the lift and drag curves, the performance of this airfoil is not impacted significantly by changes in Reynolds number, making the design more robust to changes in wind speeds and rotation speeds. This airfoil was also chosen for performance characteristics such as lift to drag ratio and manufacturability. Active pitch control was deemed necessary in order to increase the operating wind speed range of the turbine design. Controlling blade pitch to the optimal value over a range of wind speeds makes the design more robust by increasing the efficiency of the design for many wind speeds. As you can see in this slide, as the turbine spins faster and thus the tip speed ratio increases, the optimal blade pitch angle decreases relative to the plane of blade motion. This is because the increase in radial speed changes the relative wind speed direction and the blade must be rotated to avoid aerodynamic stall. Embodiment design for the turbine blades concluded with the generation of data that other groups needed for input into their designs, such as RPM, Mach number, and available torque. The main purpose of the CFD simulations was to compare a realistic geometric model with the theoretical predictions made using blade element momentum theory and the initial sizing of the turbine. For this reason, the geometry of the hub, nacelle, and pedestal were held constant with respect to each other and simply scaled in three dimensions with respect to the length of the turbine blades. During generation of the surface and volume mesh for the CFD models, specific care was taken to examine the mesh at each stage and ensure that the integrity of the, air, the original geometry was maintained. A simple check was performed by importing the geometry to the macro borders. These borders will be used later on by the CFD software to generate a triangular and polyhedral mesh. A boundary set for the simulation control volume was generated by performing a Boolean operation between the turbine geometry and the control volume. To strike a compromise between computational load and simulation accuracy, the tessellation density of the volume mesh decreased as distance from the turbine increased. To actually set up and run a simulation, there are a number of physical properties that must be set. Here we use the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation because they account for 3D viscous effects but also converge relatively quickly. The control volume must be large enough that there is no boundary layer interaction between the walls and the surfaces of the turbine. As it was previously mentioned, the data and results that are collected during the design process are the main deliverables of the entire process and will ultimately determine the validity of a certain set of parameters. Plots can be created to plot report values against any other variables, for example, plotting absolute pr pressure versus x distance. Scalar plots can be created to create a heat map of important data. One likely source of energy loss is from the vortices that are generated at the tips of the blades where the pressure on the upper and lower surfaces of the blades must equalize. Further, the nacelle boundary layer and form drag causes upstream impact on the rotor and results in a drop in static lift. The, mo the most useful results from these simulations are the streamlines that can be visualized around the blades in a cell. It is clear by the velocity drop in front of the nacelle that the whole turbine performance can be improved by reducing the low velocity region in front of the nacelle. Blade stall and flow separations are more clearly seen by viewing the velocity and pressure maps on the surface of the turbine. This allowed us to compare the predictions of induced angle of attack and how flow characteristics vary along the span of the blades. An analysis of materials was necessary before and during the conceptual design of each of the major components. The weight and cost of our product is key to making it a competitive option. As such, low cost and lightweight materials need to be implemented. In addition, material fatigue properties are of utmost importance as the device needs to be able to endure many fatigue stress cycles. The blades are subject to a wide range of loads including flapping, tension, compression, and twisting. 
As a result, they must have high stiffness so that they do not crash into the tower. In addition, it is desirable to have low density, good mechanical properties, excellent corrosion resistance, flexibility, and versi versatility of fabrication methods. During research, some relevant requirements were identified. 1. The system shall be operational in an environmental temperature range of 0 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 2. The system shall be operational in humidity up to 100%. 3. The system shall withstand wind speeds of up to 60 miles per hour without structural or operational degradation. The research commenced with a top-level review of small and large wind turbines. Based on preliminary research, the blades were deemed to have the most impact on cost, weight, and complexity. Consequently, the materials research and analysis was focused on them. Along with material research, manufacturing concepts such as structural reinforcements for the blades and a lattice support structure for the mount were identified and analyzed. An analysis of materials matrix was created to compare materials and down-select specific choices. The chart shown here plots the temperature versus altitude for numerous atmospheres. Mid-latitude summer, U.S. standard atmosphere, mid-latitude winter, NASA Dryden data for hot and cold days. Although the thermal analysis could not be completed, the temperature profiles for each location are important to getting started. The altitude of five major U.S. cities were mapped onto the temperature versus altitude curves to get insight into what type of environment conditions our product could be exposed to. According to the data found, Atlanta may be subjected to low temperatures of around 50, minus 50 Fahrenheit and high temperatures of around 105 Fahrenheit. By researching other major cities and their altitudes, we can find the same information and get a good understanding of their environment. The overall function of the rotor hub is to transmit the kinetic energy captured by the blades to the generator. To facilitate this, the blades mount onto the hub using a standard 5-bolt interface across the product family. In order to allow the turbine to capture energy at high speeds safely, a variable pitch hub system was designed. The variable pitch hub is controlled passively by the inertial of counterweights located on the blade mount. As the rotor rotates more quickly at higher wind speeds, the counterweights feather the blades in order to limit rotational speed to what is acceptable for the generator. A spring located in the device provides resistance to the feathering in order to match the blade pitch schedule. Damping sleeve bearings dampen in the feathering and limit vibrations. A best fit component analysis was used to choose the electrical components. Two AC generators were chosen to match the different turbine sizes and power outputs. The first is a 1 kilowatt generator which has a rated RPM of 450 that would be paired with the smaller turbines. The second is a larger and rated for 3 kilowatts and 300 RPMs and will be used for the larger turbines. They both have an extremely low starting torque which makes them ideal for windmill applications. The second function of the electrical system is to transmit power to the grid. First, the DC signal from the rectifier must be converted to an AC signal which matches the frequency of the grid. The grid tie inverter does both of these things and also completes the power factor correction. Two inverters were chosen based on the outputs of the different turbine sizes. The first is rated for 1 kilowatt and the second is rated for 3.2 kilowatts. They both are extremely efficient and well suited for this application. The final electrical function is to monitor power output for user metrics. The TED 502G system monitors power generated by the system and transmit the information to a user device. The user can look at instantaneous power and also track power generation over time. When designing the mounting structure, three primary goals had to be met. First, the structure had to be suitable for roofs of varying inclines. This was accomplished by de designing a hinge support to be attached to the primary vertical support. Also, the feet of the device attached to the main supports through conical press fits so that installation is easy for any angle of incline and the primary support remains vertical. These press fits contain damping pads to allow for greater tolerances and reduce vibration. Second, the structure had to have a stable interface with the roof. For flat roofs, the structure is simply fastened to a large concrete block that is far too heavy to move. This is a completely non-invasive process requiring no modifications to the roof itself. For incline roofs, the structure must be attached to the metal framing beneath the roof. This process, when necessary, is carried out by a general contractor. Lastly, the structure had to be sturdy enough to hold the weight on top of it. This was accomplished by generating an initial design and analyzing it using finite element modeling. 
In order to maintain the optimum position of the blades into the wind, a large fin is attached to the nacelle which has been designed to catch crosswinds and rotate the system into the wind. A thrust bearing is between the tower and the cell, which allows for fluid 360 degree rotation in order to prevent tangling of wires due to rotation, an electrical brushing system is used to create a connection between the wiring in the nacelle and the wiring going through the mounting tower into the grid. We chose to use electrical braking to protect the system. The system functioned as follows. An optical sensor measures the RPM of the turbine and passes this information onto a controller. The controller is programmed with logic such that when the RPM becomes greater than the maximum allowed, 300 RPM, a switch will stop the current from the generator from flowing to the grid and force it to flow through the capacitor bank. The controller will do so by sending a small voltage to a transistor. The transistor can provide a strong enough voltage to trigger a switch that will redirect the current. As the capacitor charges, it creates a higher load on the generator, which causes braking. In order to protect the system from ice accumulation, two different methods of prevention were implemented. The initial layer of protection comes from a coating of black paint onto the moving parts of the system. This helps lower the temperature at which ice accumulation occurs. The second system involves covering the parts with a DuPont ice preventing phenol cover. This must be applied once every two years and prevents the accumulation of ice up to negative 30 degrees C. With the centrifugal force of the turbine blades moving, any snow or ice that is not stuck to the blades will slide off. The approach to the stress analysis was to take the most efficient route to reduce the amount of duplicated effort. Since the de design is modular and the magnitude of the loads on the system are proportional to disk area, the largest swept area would yield the largest loads and therefore the largest stresses. It is conservative to for focus the stress analysis efforts on the 4 meter installation with a 1.5 ultimate load factor multiplied to the applied loads. All of the major components were modeled using Patran 2008 R2 and results were calculated using MSC NASTRAN 2008. Models were made to be as simple as possible. For example, the main mounting structure was modeled using simple 1D elements and a linear solution was used to calculate stresses and reaction loads, whereas the interface between the roof and mounting structure was modeled using 2D quad 4 elements and a non-linear solution was used to develop more realistic stresses around the attached bolt locations. The stresses were then compared to values from material property handbooks such as Mill Handbook 5H and MMPDS06 to develop ultimate margins of safety and to assist in making changes to design when necessary. Here are more models and results from the finite element analysis. Analysis of the blade design is shown in two of the three pictures, and the third picture depicts one of the mounting brackets. After calculating the margins of safety, all but the blade and hub attachment were found to have very high values. The margins that are reported as high mean that the margins of safety are at least 300%. In some cases, these margins were considerably higher. This suggests that the design can be scaled to reduce weight and cost and still have more than acceptable margins of safety. Or, the design can be accommodated for a much larger nacelle, generator, and blade installation. go over the financial analysis of our system. To begin the financial analysis of the family of wind turbines created by this design effort, we must begin with an accurate cost assessment to manufacture and install the turbine. This chart lists the component breakdown of each tur turbine into its constituent parts. Price determination was accomplished one of two ways. For regular commercial components, list prices were taken from distributors and assigned to these components. For manufactured components, an estimation process was followed. This process begins with a rough component volume for each component taken from 3D models. Using raw material prices for materials used for these components, a component raw material cost was determined. This estimation also accounts for labor and overhead. Factoring in an estimated installation time of 10 man hours at $100 per hour, we arrive at a final installed 2, 3, and 4 meter turbine cost of roughly $7,500, $8,300, and $8,700 respectively. The next step in building the wind turbine financial analysis is to determine negative cash flows of ownership for the purchaser. This will include the final turbine sale price and maintenance costs. 
To determine the final sale cost, we must add R&D cost to the installed turbine cost. A total engineering development cost of $112,500 was estimated. Splitting one half of 1% of this cost in each turbine sold increases the turbine price by $563 each. This requires 200 units sold to break even on the engineering investment. Additionally, yearly maintenance costs result in total yearly maintenance costs of $350, $400, and $450 for the 2 meter, 3, 3 meter, and 4 meter turbines respectively. To complete the source data needed for the wind turbine financial analysis, it is necessary that we finally determine the positive cash flows to the owner from selling back electricity generated by the turbine. We begin by assuming that Atlanta's average wind speed at commercial office building rooftop height is 6 meters per second. From the BETS constant, we can determine the maximum power generation possible for each turbine size. From this maximum possible value, we assume our turbine models will attain an industry standard 70% of this value. From this instantaneous value, we can determine the one year kilowatt hour generated by each turbine installed, wind, installed in the Atlanta wind profile. At a rate of 15 cents per kilowatt hour for green energy sellback, we arrive at year one's positive cash flow for power sales. Combining all this source data, we can ultimately determine incremental cash flows to the owner. The 4 meter turbine analysis is shown here as an example. Note the Georgia specific tax savings of 35% of the purchase price of the system in the first year only. Using this final result of incremental cash flows from ownership, we can now complete the financial analysis of the decision to purchase and operate a wind turbine by evaluating the net present value and internal rate of return of the decision to buy. NPV corrects incremental cash flows over time into today's dollars by discounting them over time at a given interest rate. IRR presents an alternative measure of the value of a decision. For the decision to have positive value today, we want the IRR to be greater than the opportunity cost of using that money. Unfortunately, in Atlanta's wind profile, the 2 meter turbine never reaches positive present value over a 30 year horizon. The 3 meter turbine presents positive value over an ownership horizon just over 20 years, and the 4 meter turbine presents positive value around 11 years. This makes a strong case for Atlanta customers to focus on the 4 meter product. However, cities with more favorable wind profiles will see quicker and substantial values from the 2 meter turbine. As an example, if we were to market in an area with an average wind speed of 10 meters per second, the 2 meter turbine presents positive value just after 7 years with a 10 year IRR of 11%. The 3 meter turbine presents positive value after 3 years with a 10 year IRR of 48%. And the 4 meter presents positive value after just one year with a staggering 10 year IRR of 129%. I wanted to end our presentation by recapping a team structure and operations as well as going over what went well for our team and what we would have changed. As mentioned earlier, our team consisted of 15 members broken up into three teams. Our team decided to have one large group meeting a week along with the individual sub-teams arranging their own meetings during the week in order to provide a detailed update at the large group meeting. The initial schedule that was presented at the beginning of the assignment was not necessarily as heavily enforced as it should have been, which resulted in some delay for completing our tasks. The main method we used for document sharing was Google Documents, and the off-campus students would call in via Skype in order to attend any of the group meetings. From the re results of the team poll during the last few weeks of the project, there are some major lessons that can be learned regarding what worked well for us and what didn't. One aspect we thought worked well but ended up hindering the team's progress was the initial division between the design and analysis team. This caused confusion later on because the two components are necessarily integrated in a project with this much technical design work. It was also difficult for us as a team to come up with a standard method for document sharing, meeting notes, and other important information at the beginning of the group project. However, once we were able to set up a standard weekly team meeting time and began recording meeting minutes and keeping them in one specific location, things ran much more smoothly for our team. As a whole, we worked well together and overcame many of the obstacles associated with having a team scattered through different locations and time zones. We figured out what methods worked best, self-assigned work, and asked for assistance when needed. While it was difficult to finish a design project of this magnitude in the small amount of time we were given, we came together to develop the best solution. In this project, our group effort as a whole turned out to be much greater than the sum of our parts.